Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. I want to uh, let, remind you that uh, next weekend we have a very special weekend planned. We have Pastor Richard, Nancy Salazar coming to minister in many ways. Pastor Richard is a foremost preacher in our fellowship as far as I'm concerned and uh, has a very good influence in our lives and is able to communicate God's word and God's truth uh, in a very unique way. Uh, he'll be preaching for us uh, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. Uh, on Saturday morning, we, as you can see, we have special ladies meeting that's going to be happening uh, at 10 a.m., and if you want to come a little early, that's fine, but at 10 a.m. sharp, uh, we're going to be getting started. Uh, we've also added a special Kind of like, you know, when you get someone, a musician, you say, we're going to special encore performance. We've added Pastor Richard going to be coming at the same time as the ladies' meeting, so we'll have the men upstairs and the ladies will have the sanctuary. So all the brothers are invited on Saturday morning as well. Uh, You want to make sure that you invite somebody. Uh, If you look on your uh, phone app, uh, I think it will come on tomorrow. Uh, You can look at the Bible app, and then you can look at events. And if you have your GPS turned on, you will see uh, all of the meetings listed in, in one thing. And you can share that out. You can tap on it and share it to all of your friends and your family. And it's a very good way. It has all the graphic, the links, all that we're doing. And you'll really want to be part of that. So let's invite people out so that we have a very strong meeting, that we have the presence of God praying for souls, for people to come to Christ, backsliders to come out of their muck and mire and come back into the fold where they belong. Doesn't that sound good? Praise God. So we're going to have a very uh, good time next week. Praise the Lord. We're going to move right along today and tell you happy Father's Day. We are glad that you're here today, all of the dads, uh, all of the future dads. We want to tell you that uh, God has good things up ahead for you. So the first thing I'd just like to start out by talking with you about is that fathers matter. Fathers matter. The reason I want to make that simple two-word statement here today is because in the world that we live in, there is so much ambivalence towards things that are important. We look at Things like motherhood and fatherhood as well, they're optional and they're just things that some people do and then we point our fingers and say certain people shouldn't be mothers, shouldn't be fathers and you know it just gets to the point where we all are just kind of like, well, who cares? Well, I'd like to tell you God cares. Young people matter to God and if young people matter to God then that means fathers matter. George Herbert wrote this. He says, one father is more than a hundred schoolmasters. I want you to get that. Because, you know, all of us here would say, you know, all the kids, they need a good education. They need better schooling. The schools should improve. And I won't deny that. Matter of fact, you ought to look into Christian education. They have tremendous schooling in Christian education. But That is not my point today. My point is there's nothing that can take the place of a dad, of a father. I'm not talking about a male or a baby maker. Because any male, most males, can make a baby. You can, what we call, father a child. I don't like that term. It should be more like animals, sire a child. Because there's a difference between being a father and being a baby maker. So what is it that fathers need to do according to the Word of God? According to the Word of God. Because, see, God created fatherhood. That's why we refer to our heavenly Father. That's why Jesus said and prayed to the Father, because God understands fatherhood. So we should look at what God describes as fathers. And this is how we should live our lives, guys. 
This is how we should do. Don't, don't just go by what someone else tells us to do or what maybe even our children sometimes demand us to be. But we should go by God's way. And I just want to give you some simple truths, but very, very critical to the world in which we live in today. First of all, fathers lead the way. They need to lead the way because fathers are born and made and created to lead the way. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6 and verse number 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. A man named Joseph Joubert said, Children need models rather than critics. They need models rather, rather than critics. They need someone to show them the way. Every person that's here that's successful in any kind of endeavor has had someone that would show them the way. Every musician, even self-made musicians, uh, had someone that they watched how they put their fingers on the guitar or how they did a certain beat uh, or how they played a, a little riff on the keyboard. You learn how to lay blocks because you knew a block maker who was able to do that, a construction worker, a, a truck driver, a, whatever your profession is, someone showed you the way. As fathers, we are to show our children the ways of God, the way of Christ, uh, the way that a person should conduct themselves. Because if you don't, my friend, the world will. If you don't, the gang member will. The drug addict will. The one who is loose in their morals will show them, hey, come do this. It's fun. The one who drinks too much will say, come on, have a little drink. Uh, drown your sorrows. If you don't do it, someone else will. Some say, well, I bring my kid to church so that my kid can learn. Well, I want to tell you that it needs more than that. It needs more than that. And there are many here that are newly married or are planning on getting married or someday want to get married and have a family. Can I tell you the things that I'm talking about now you need to put into practice now? Because if you wait till you get married, until you have kids, you're not going to be do it. <laughs> you just won't do it. Because who you are now is what you'll be when you have a parent. You don't just magically turn into somebody new once a baby arrives or children arrive. You don't. You're still the same person, but now you've got more burdens, more hardship, more self-sacrifice that's necessary, more sleepless nights, more or less time for yourself. So if you cannot become this person that the Bible describes now, then when it gets time you more than likely will not produce. We see here that the Scripture tells us, as you can read on our screens, that there is something called discipline and instruction. I think we all know what discipline is, that when someone goes wayward, they're naughty, they need to be disciplined in some shape or form. We know what instruction is, but I think that there's deeper and uh, more fuller meanings to it than just what we kind of know. For example, I think that discipline isn't just about, you know, punishment or some sort of uh, thing that we do in order to correct poor behavior. I think it requires us as fathers to have self-discipline. Because I think any father who has any kind of passion, you also have a, a, a little core of anger in there, don't you? <laughs> the, the ladies are going, mm-hmm. Yeah, bro, you, do, you know you do. If you don't, you need to get some. Because having anger is not a bad thing. Anger is an okay thing as long as it's anger under control. Anger that's funneled in the right direction. And that is what I think in order to discipline our kids, in order to train our children, we have to have ourselves under control. Brother, have you learned to keep yourself in check yet? <laughs> that's a hard one. That's a hard one. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a grandfather, and I still realize that for my own life, keeping myself in check is like, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job because things pop up, emotions arise, and before you know it, <laughs> instruction is also more than a lesson. 
It's more than a lesson. You know, we think of instruction as, a, you know, a picture of a child coming into the classroom scenario and they sit down with their books and their equipment and whatever it is they need and that there's someone standing at the front of the classroom teaching and instructing and things like that. But instruction is much more than that. Because everybody who has a university degree here knows that when you got into the world and actually started working, much of the things you learned at university weren't applicable. (laughs) They didn't seem to fully apply. I'm not saying that it was wrong or bad. I'm just saying that you had to kind of really learn how to do the job, and what you learned in a classroom setting wasn't really sufficient for becoming proficient at your job. And the same thing is true for our kids. We can't just sit and say, okay, here's what you do. Here's lesson one, two, three. That's not enough. They need you to show them the way. A man named Charles Kettering said, every father should remember one day his son will follow his example and not his advice. Let that one sink in. I've pontificated to my kids and grandkids for years, this is what you should do. Here's what the Bible says. Here's how you should be. But when I see them, they're just like me. They have so many of my traits. If it's a good trait, I'm happy and proud. If it's one of those ones that make me cringe, I look and I go, oh, please, God, no. Don't let them be like me. But yet, they follow your example. My daughter, my youngest daughter, has always said this. She says, my dad is the first man I ever loved. She says that I was her first boyfriend, so to speak. Think about the ramifications of that, guys. Think of the responsibility that that entails. You are her example. You are the one that is setting her standard of a man. You are showing her what it's like to be a husband, and that's what she'll aspire to. She probably won't want someone exactly like you, but the truth is is she'll know that this is the things that should be done or shouldn't be done, and if your exampleship towards her is less than stellar, less than biblical, less than passionate, then I want to tell you that you've let your daughter down. Someone said, and I agree, that the best thing you can do to train your children is to love their mother. I think that's true. Now, I know that we live in a broken world, and there may be people here that you've divorced. There may be people here that you're separated from your spouse, but that doesn't negate the fact that mutual respect needs to occur. occur. What are you showing them if you end up being violent or ugly or, 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 or nasty or saying rude things? You're showing them that spouses are disposable. You're showing them that that's okay for families to act like that. And while none of us are perfect, we always say that, and we all know it's true, and we all, uh, not all of us, but many of us rely on that and say, well, I'm not perfect. Well, no kidding. Does that mean, so the Bible says what it says. Does it say, because you're not perfect, you don't have to do what it says? It doesn't say that. It takes into account that we fail. But on the other hand, nevertheless, should this be our, our, our focus? How you live is how your kids will begin to pattern their lives. Maybe not identically, but they will see. And if they go wayward, one day the Spirit of God will call them back. And they'll begin to refer to you because you are their reference point. Can you say amen? Amen. This is what the Bible teaches us. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, In verse 3, it talks to leaders, and uh, I think as a father, you can call yourself a leader, don't you? I mean, what are you? Who's the leader in your home? You know, sometimes fathers, and I do this too, you know, say, uh, jokingly, you know, uh, they'll come to talk to you. You say, well, go talk to the boss. You're pointing to mom, you know, (laughs) pointing to the mother and say, go talk to the boss. She's really in charge. (laughs) 
we were in Ikea, which I've got to tell you, I give you guys a lot of credit to say uh, my favorite thing is to go to Ikea. I'm like, man, my favorite thing is to stay far away from Ikea, man. Uh, Ikea is like a death sentence. They even have it kind of like a prison, you know, one way in, one way out. You know, it's very much like a prison. So uh, one day Grace was taking me to prison, and uh, we went in there, and there was this little advertising sign that says, uh, who really wears the trousers, you know, in the family? And I said, Grace, stand right by there, and I took a picture of her. <laughs> you know, and we jokingly do that, but in reality, the Bible says in First Peter chapter 5 and verse 3 that we should not be dom- domineering over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. Now, this is applicable, obviously, to the church and is foremost to the church, but I've got to tell you that if you've uh, raised a family, you know that they're very much like a miniature church. They're people that need to be trained, people that need to be, uh, uh, have wisdom and understanding and guidance. You oversee them. And the Bible says don't do it by domineering. That word domineering means to not use brute force. Because, you know, truthfully, you can control a lot of people with brute force. You can. You see harsh governments around the world, they, they control their people with a militant militia. They're able to take those who are armed and dangerous uh, and control people. And they string up people in, in public squares as examples of those who would tend to rebel. And you can control people like that. And some fathers, unfortunately, that's their mode of operand, modus operandi when it comes to leading. But I'm here to tell you, if you want to lead Christ-like way, the Christian way, the biblical way, that means that you're going to be an example. You're going to do it your by following Christ, giving them a role model, a pattern for them to follow. Our fatherly cry, brothers, should be the same as the Apostle Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That's what we should be telling our children, be follow me as I follow Christ. We should be able to say that to them. That should be our, our cry, our, our fatherly cry. So fathers need to and must and are designed to lead the way. But I'm here to tell you also that fathers need support. Fathers need support. Can't just do it on our own. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3 says, Honor your father and mother. This is your first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. (laughs) Honor your father and mother, young people. Honor your father and mother, those that have parents, because it will go well with you. I used to tell my kids, if you don't, I'm going to shorten your life. (laughs) If you don't listen to me, your life will be significantly shorter than you planned. And the (laughs) reality... It was a joke. It was a joke. Don't call social services on me here. (laughs) <laughs> I always used to say this, go ahead and call social services. That, that's going to take them at least 20 minutes to get here. I go, you know what I can do in 20 minutes? <laughs> it's another joke, sort of. <laughs> fathers who fulfill their role as fathers deserve honor. They deserve honor. I know that there are many fathers who do not fill their, fulfill their roles. And they have just created lives through their uh, uh, bodily functions. But I'm here to tell you that there are many men who are striving to fulfill that role. And yes, they fall short. Yes, they do. But their strive, their press, their push in life is to be a good father. They're trying to be a dad, and they deserve honor. They deserve honor. And honor goes beyond a church service or a ceremony or a party. Those are fine. But we need to honor dads by supporting them. 
And the older you get, the more you need to support them. I love what Bola wrote and what she read because uh, you could tell that she was appreciative of her father. I'm sure that Shola wasn't the perfect dad at all times. Uh, and the reason I know that is because I'm a father too and I know how hard it can be. But I want to tell you that he did, does deserve the honor and his daughter is showing him that. And if you will begin to do that, you will see that your children will begin to honor you not just in the public arena but also in private settings and affairs which is where it's most important because every dad here knows that there are moments of loneliness, there are moments of feeling like a failure, there are times when you look at your life as a dad and say, look it, I didn't quite measure up. Some of you may say, I've just blown it, I've just blown it, I've just blown it. And that could be quite possible. But I want to tell you that you still worked hard to be the best man that you can be, and that deserves honor. We support them not by removing their God-given burden of responsibility, saying, oh, it's okay, it's okay. It's not okay if you don't live up to your responsibility. You need to. And that's why, young man, those that are going to get married at some point, you need to start exercising responsibility now. You need to start showing that you can be somewhere on time. You need to start showing that you can do what's been asked of you. You need to demonstrate that you won't just take all of the money that you get and spend it frivolously, that you're frugal, that you're able to budget that you're able to plan, that you're able to organize all of the things that are necessary for every dad. And yet we're supposed to support them with all that we have. Sometimes our society only wants to praise the heroic. But I'm here to tell you that we need to praise the ordinary when it comes to fatherhood. We need to praise the ordinary because that's who we are. I think that there are some dads that may from time to time act heroically, but the majority of us are just average Joes. We're just average people. We're just people who have just grown up how we've grown up with all of our problems, all of our sins, all of our issues. We're in church trying to serve Jesus the best we can, trying to raise our family, and it's those ordinary days that matter the most. I might have shared this with you before, but uh, I think it was... uh, it was last year, it was in July of last year, that we were at conference, our, our U.S. conference. And uh, it was the uh, day before we were going to fly home, and our son said, hey, you want to have breakfast? Yeah, we got together, and we had brought the grandkids and everybody, and we had breakfast at a restaurant. And uh, he says, hey, Dad, what do you miss the most, you know, about being over here? And we were, we'd been chatting about airplanes because he's an air traffic controller, pilot, does all these things with planes. So we were talking about planes. We were talking with my grandson about trains, you know, because he likes trains. And I was telling him about we have lots of trains in England. And uh, we were going on. And then Tommy says, well, Dad, what is it that you miss the most? And I said, you know what I miss the most? Times like these. Well, I can just sit and talk to you guys about important things about the things that are just average in life because that's what makes me a good father. That's what makes you a good father. We should praise the ordinary. If you have a talk with your dad today, you ought to say, thanks, dad, for that talk. If your dad gives you advice that you've heard a hundred times before, you should say, thanks again, dad. I'll never forget that. We need to support our fathers. Gracie Drew reposted a picture of Pastor Allen on Instagram. Uh, it's a picture of him doing some work in the church with that uh, headlight that I used in the illustration. And uh, be honest with you, it's not the most becoming photo of Pastor Allen. <laughs> I mean, it's not one you're going to, like, print, hang up in your home. But I thought, you know, that's just an excellent photo because that's who he is. That's what he does day in and day out. That's who he is. That's what makes him dad to Gracie. And the truth is, is we all have those things that we see our fathers doing that we might have taken for granted that we never should because our fathers need our support. Honor them. I want to close today with this thought. A few decades ago, it was common for Christians to witness using this term 
and the term was Jesus saves. And in the inner cities of America, it was not uncommon to go through the downtown, the city center areas, and see buildings with neon signs much like what you see on the screen today. They would advertise their churches, Jesus saves. I want to tell you there is nothing wrong with the term Jesus saves. As a matter of fact, those two words are quite powerful. We know that Jesus, who is the Christ, he's the Messiah. He's the one who died for the sins of mankind. And all those who put their faith in Jesus will be saved, will be born again. Many people used to question that sign and say, well, what does he save me from? And they would usually use that in a mocking term, not really inquiring of what it really meant. But I want to remind you that that word save in the original languages is a word packed with much meaning. It means to deliver or to rescue. It means to heal and make whole. And I want to tell all of my brothers who are fathers here today and my potential fathers that fathers need Jesus. Fathers need Jesus. We need to be delivered because we have a whole pack full of sins. We have habits that we struggle with and we need Jesus. One of the things that I try to do in our church, and I've been doing it from the time we got here, October 13th, 2016, is I try to share with the guys who I think are going to go on to further ministry, those who want ministry, those who ask of me. I share with them about church, not only what my vision is, not only what I expect. I don't just teach them the Bible, though I hopefully do all those things. I also share with them how I feel when I'm going through something. I try to express to them the things that are going on in my life, you know, and I I tell them when I'm angry. I tell them when, look look at they because they'll say, and what happened today, he said, uh, hey, are you stressed? Because probably look a little stressed. And I said, no, I'm I'm slightly angry. And he's like, whoa. And I said, let me explain to you, because one day you're going to be leading a church. One day you're going to be in my shoes. And every father here knows that we need to share this with our young people and share this with those who are trying to impart. We don't bleed on them. We don't say, well, I'm going to having a horrible day. No, we tell them things because they're going to go through this. One day, son, you're going to, you, right now, all you care about is a basketball or a football. That's all you care about. But one day, you're going to see that girl who you think is yucky, and you're going to like her. And when you like that girl, here's how you should act. Here's how you should deal with it when you are sexually stimulated. Here's what you do when you're not sure what to do when you like a girl. Dads, we teach them that. We teach them how to respect women and how to work a job and how to stay diligent on their schoolwork. And sometimes we have to kind of metaphorically get them by the scruff of their neck and say, hey, keep on doing this. But we can't do all of that. We cannot share. We cannot impart unless we have Jesus. Because just sharing that you're angry is not enough. My father got angry all the time. And it went out of bounds of what was righteous and holy. And he could have said, well, I'm angry. I could have said, I don't care less. You exploded. The reality is, is we need Jesus, brothers. We need to be delivered from who we are sometimes. The word means to be rescued. We need to be rescued. And we hate that, don't we? We hate that. I can remember years ago, I was a teenager, and I used to like to go into the oceans of Southern California and ride waves just with my body. And I was a pretty good swimmer, and the bigger the waves, uh, the more I liked it. And I remember going to the beach by myself. I did crazy things like hitchhiking to the beach. So I would hitchhike and get a ride from who knows who, man. It could have been a serial killer. But I'd get there and go to the beach. So I'm there by myself, these huge waves, uh, and I'm swimming out, paddling, and I think I'm strong, but really I'm just a skinny teenager, man, just paddling out, riding these waves. Well, they were way over my uh, abilities. 
And I remember wave after wave just crushing me and crushing me. And I, was, and I could see as I would bob up and try to gain my bearings, I could see that there was a lifeguard ship, that, not ship a large boat that had come in and was saving people because the waters were so turbulent. And people were, hey, hey, over here. And I remember in myself, I'm not going to say anything. I was drowning. I was about ready to die. But I wouldn't admit that I needed rescuing. Sometimes as dads, we're like that. We don't want to say, I need saving. I need saving. But we do. And it's okay. Fortunately, one of the lifeguards comes and doesn't chastise me and say, hey, boy, you're in over your head. He didn't do that. He said, no, grab this. And he gave me this big orange tube. And he, because he was stronger than me, he had more abilities than me. He had more uh, 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 wisdom and understanding of how the currents were. He was able to take me to safety. And that's very much how Jesus is. He doesn't chastise you for needing rescuing. He just says, grab on by faith. Hang on. I'm going to take you. I know how to, I know how to uh, facilitate these waters. Brother, we need to be delivered. We need to be rescued. We need to be healed. Because the truth is, is that if we're going to be good fathers... Whatever we are is what we're going to impart to our kids. And so if we have big holes in our heart, if we're wounded, if we've had things done to us that have not yet been healed, then what will happen is we'll begin to pass that on to them. And instead of producing a child that is honorable and and glorifying to God and a child that will help your family, what you'll do is you'll produce a replica of a broken individual. That should scare you because it is very scary. That's why we need Jesus to heal us, to heal us. Stay focused. We're almost done. The word save means to make whole. None of us want to admit that we don't have what it takes, that we can't go the distance. (laughs) First time I started riding bikes and they talked about going 100 miles, I remember saying, I don't know, in my mind I was saying, I'm not sure I can make it. But whenever they'd ask me, I said, I'll make it no problem. I'm not going to tell them that I could do that, that I couldn't do something that I didn't have all that was necessary to complete the task. We never want to admit that we're half a father, that we're missing some key ingredients as a father, and our pride keeps us from accepting what Christ has. But I want to tell you today, if you will humble yourself, if you will come before him and say, look it, I need to be delivered, please rescue me, heal my broken heart, make me whole, give me the skills that I need to be the father or grandfather that I must be, I want to tell you that he will because he's a good God, a loving God, a kind God, powerful God, an awesome God. He wants to do great things in your life, in mine. Dads, we matter. We matter. We matter. We shouldn't walk around proud because we're males, peacock all of who we are, But we should stand strong because the world needs strong men. The world needs men that are strong to say, I need Jesus and can walk in the love and the compassion. Because that's what real strength is, right? It's not just about muscles. It's not just about how you look. It's about who you are on the inside. We need Jesus. Fathers need Jesus. I'd like us all to bow our heads as we go before the Lord here today. Would you bow your heads with me? If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 Or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you, 
We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.